I was 19 when I joined the historic March on Washington. I didn't realize it then, but my life changed course that very hot August day in 1963. I saw Martin Luther King only from a distance as he delivered his I Have a Dream speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial. While King lived, I never met him and never considered myself one of his followers. But after his death, my life became closely connected with his legacy as I came to know his widow, his family, and his associates. I would devote much of my life to studying his life, and his ideals would ultimately shape my own. King seemed to become wiser as I became older. But my youthful political activism was actually inspired by another person I encountered a few months after the march. I heard Bob Moses speak at a planning meeting of the 1964 Mississippi Summer Project. While King had become internationally famous for his role in the Montgomery bus boycott and the Birmingham campaign of 1963, Moses had attracted little attention except among those familiar with his brave efforts to help black Mississippians win the right to vote. I would only gradually understand the full significance of King's speech, but Moses' words and accomplishments had a dramatic and immediate impact on me. Now, perhaps this was because King's charisma made him a person I could admire but not emulate, not even hope to emulate. He was a preacher leading other preachers in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Bob Moses, in contrast, was a former high school teacher who displayed a soft-spoken humility, always emphasizing that he was an organizer, not a leader. He was affiliated with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC as it was known, and exemplified the youthful SNCC field secretaries who saw their roles as encouraging the development of self-reliant grassroots leaders able to build the freedom struggle from the bottom up rather than top down. As I became more aware of SNCC's remarkable accomplishments in segregationist strongholds in the rural Deep South, I was amazed by the way SNCC workers inspired poor Mississippians without much formal education to believe that they could overcome racial and economic oppression without depending on national civil rights leaders such as King or even SNCC itself our job is to work ourselves out of a job, SNCC workers would insist. I would later meet Fannie Lou Hamer, who had worked her entire adult life on a Mississippi cotton plantation before attending a SNCC meeting and then attempting to register to vote. She was jailed and beaten but later become one of the black Mississippians who emerged as grassroots leaders as a result of SNCC's organizing efforts. Bob Moses was referring to people like Hamer when he compared the impact of SNCC's organizing to atomic energy to illustrate how skilled organizing can produce an enormous amount of energy from a small amount of resources that are available to poor people. While King's ability to influence public opinion, help bring about the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, SNCC's projects help prepare many poor people to exercise their new rights. I became immersed in the freedom struggle as it moved from the rural south to the urban north and tried to apply some of the ideas I learned from Moses and other SNCC workers. Their emphasis on grassroots organizing helped me understand the limitations of middle-class reform strategies that didn't empower poor people. Even when I decided that my talents were more suited to academic life than community organizing, SNCC's organizing concepts influenced my teaching and my scholarship. In 1981, I published In Struggle, SNCC and the Black Awakening of the 1960s, which illuminated the crucial role of Bob Moses and SNCC and a freedom struggle that sought goals beyond civil rights legislation. 
Bob Moses was one of the many stick workers I interviewed for that book. Four years after In Struggle was published, I received an unexpected phone call from Mrs. Coretta Scott King, asking me whether I'd edit the papers of Martin Luther King. So after building my reputation as a scholar by drawing attention to Moses' alternative to King's top-down leadership, I, sudden, I was suddenly faced with this task of trying to see the world from King's perspective, as revealed in his correspondence and his writings and sermons and speeches, including that dream oration I had not fully understood two decades earlier. But even after becoming King's editor, I continued to insist that our freedom struggle would have happened even without him. But the passage of time made me more able to recognize that our struggle would have been quite different without King's prophetic leadership. King's oratory inspired us to believe that our struggle was about more than civil rights. It was about social justice and human rights and democracy, about transcendent political and spiritual and philosophical principles, about the Declaration of Independence, the Sermon on the Mount, the writings of Mahatma Gandhi. Having witnessed SNCC's dis disintegration amidst the destructive racial violence of the late 1960s, I gained an appreciation for King's resolute commitment to nonviolent resistance. As King's editor, I would restudy his I Have a Dream speech and had many opportunities to return to the Lincoln Memorial. I began to understand how little I had understood about the insights that King had packed into a 16-minute speech. I realize now why he warned us not to seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Recognizing that unleashed social energy could explode in destructive rather than constructive ways, King urged us to meet the physical force of oppression with moral force. A year after Mrs. King called me, the National King Holiday was celebrated for the first time. And I began to see King's dream become an enduring source of inspiration for young people of all races. I still hoped, however, as they celebrated King, that they were also celebrating something that was more than one man. That they were celebrating Bob Moses and Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker and so many others who helped this nation free itself from the legacy of racial supremacy. Now, King's dream that Mississippi would one day be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice seemed fanciful when SNCC workers were mobilizing Mississippi poor people to demand social justice. But I lived to see the day when black sharecroppers who once picked cotton helped pick a president of the United States. Today, King is an American icon familiar to people around the world. I devote much of my life to studying his legacy, editing his papers. I helped design the King Memorial that is being built near where he spoke in 1963. But I have not forgotten Bob Moses and SNCC. I see Bob's influence in people who have never heard of him, although he continues to apply his organizing talents in the field of education. I heard Bob's influence in Reed's speech. His ability to nurture the untapped abilities of people at the bottom of the social order is today reflected in the work of thousands of teachers who nurture the talents, the latent talents, of students who have few advantages. Here in Silicon Valley, I see his influence in institutions that understand the need to allow employees to develop and contribute the full range of their talents that encourage initiative from the bottom up rather than simply from the top down. I see the influence of both Bob Moses and Martin Luther King and President Obama, who was a community organizer before becoming a political leader whose speeches often remind me of King. Obama may not have been Moses' equal as an organizer, and he can't quite match King's prophetic eloquence, but he is still, by a large measure, the best president elected in this century. The world, needs <laughs> the world needs the messages of both Bob Moses and Martin Luther King. 
When I think of Bob Moses, I often think of the freedom song lyric, I've got the light of freedom, I'm going to let it shine. A lyric that expresses the way good organizing, good teaching, good leadership can set free the best qualities of people who have never been allowed to shine. King, too, reminds me of another freedom song, Keep Your Eyes on the Prize, which expresses why the world needs visionary leaders as well as innovative organizers. King's speech inspires us to dream and to struggle for a more just and free world, if not for ourselves, then for our children. Perhaps the most important thing I've learned since that hot August day, almost 50 years ago, is that King's speeches are freedom songs. Let freedom ring from every hill.